Coffee's been my ride or die all my life. My name is Sabrina Scott Pappas. I am the chief executive coffee nerd of ES Beverage. <laughs> Comcast Rise changed my life. They put me in a unique space where I could scale on my own. Apply today for a variety of business, marketing, and tech makeovers on us. And keep rising. Comcast Rise came about with the desire for us to help communities as they are recovering from the pandemic as well as social unrest. Comcast Rise has had incredible impact already. More than $11 million in grants, 6,700 entrepreneurs, and 422 cities. Comcast put me in a unique space where I could scale on my own. To be able to make this kind of impact is unbelievable. Good evening, everyone. I'm Caroline Hannon, Senior Vice President of Comcast Western New England Region, and I'm delighted to represent Comcast employees from across Connecticut, Western Massachusetts, and Vermont to celebrate Black History Month. We thought it was fitting to open tonight's screening event with a video about the Comcast RISE program, which champions representation, investment, strength, and empowerment for small businesses owned by people of color, as well as those owned by women. The program offers the opportunity for these businesses to apply for marketing and technology resources to help grow their businesses and thrive for years to come. Comcast Rise launched in 2020 and is part of Project Up, an expanded diversity, equity, and inclusion commitment that Comcast announced last summer, which also includes our Internet Essentials and Lift Zone initiatives. Across New England, over 100 small businesses, from restaurants and salons to professional services and retail, have been selected as Comcast RISE recipients to receive creative production services from Effective, the Advertising Sales Division of Comcast Cable, or technology upgrades from Comcast Business. These businesses are the backbone of our local economy, and supporting them will help their communities thrive. Tonight, we are proud to partner with TV One Networks to bring you this special viewing of Unsung Presents, The Decades. This event wouldn't be possible without the partnership of the TV One team who enthusiastically jumped on board to share this documentary with us. I'm thrilled that one of our local Comcast Rise recipients, Makaya Clark, who owns Unknown Clothing, a retail shop and event venue in New Britain, Connecticut, will be joining us for a panel to close this evening's screening. Our panel will also include Kimberly Kersey, Executive Director for the Amistad Center for Arts and Culture in Hartford, Connecticut, Andrew Cade, Senior Vice President for the Urban League of Springfield, Massachusetts, Jason Ryan, executive producer, original programming and production at TV One Networks and Clio TV, TV One's producer of tonight's film. And finally, our moderator, Leslie Mays, reporter from NBC Connecticut News. We're looking forward to hearing from all of our panelists after the film to continue discussing music's impact on civil rights from a local perspective. At Comcast NBC Universal, Diversity and inclusion are crucial components to all of our efforts to create and deliver the best technology and entertainment for our customers. It's our responsibility to reflect the customers and audiences we serve in all aspects of our business, from the products we create to the organizations we support, and to fostering a better and more inclusive workspace and a world where everyone has the opportunity to succeed. Tonight's screening is one of the many ways we're celebrating Black History Month, and we're honored to be sharing this story with you. Make sure to tune into TV One on Xfinity X1 to watch the additional decades in the series. To find it, just say TV One into your Xfinity voice remote. Before we move on, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge Trevor DePass, a leader from Ben, our Comcast Black Employee Network, who was instrumental in planning and inviting Ben members from across the Northeast to join tonight's event. Thank you, Trevor. I'd now like to turn it over to Diane Hannes, President and General Manager of NBC Connecticut and Telemundo Connecticut, to say a few words. 
Thank you, Diane, for partnering with us on tonight's event and for all the incredible work your team does to support our local communities. Hello, I'm Diane Hannes, President and General Manager at NBC in Telemundo, Connecticut. I want to thank Comcast Western New England Region, TV1, and everyone that collaborated to make this event possible. At NBC in Telemundo, Connecticut, we support and promote black heritage, not just this month, but all year round. Our employees come from diverse backgrounds, but have a common goal that consists of informing, entertaining, and engaging with all viewers. We accomplish these things by striving to tell diverse stories and create a multicultural environment that is inclusive and celebrates every heritage. Tonight's program highlights legendary black musical artists and performances of the 90s. This era in music was a breakthrough era as many talented artists received overdue recognition in the mainstream media. Because of these artists today, our commitment remains strong as a media and entertainment company to support movements that promote diversity, equality, and inclusion. Congratulations to the producers and storytellers that have made tonight's program possible. Now it is my honor and pleasure to introduce Rory Peters, SVP of Content Distribution and Marketing at TV One. Thank you for joining us tonight and enjoy the presentation. Thank you, Diane, for the warm introduction and good evening. On behalf of the TV One and Clio TV families, I'm excited to be here in virtual land from the comfort of my in-home studio with all of you today. At TV One and Clio TV, we are in the fortunate position of representing, preserving, and celebrating Black history 24-7, all 12 months of the year. So when February rolls around, we have to get creative about how we highlight the richness of Black contributions. It's important to us that we provide our viewers with content that reflects the diversity of Black life. Because Black stories aren't monolithic, we strive to bring multifaceted ideas, thoughts, backgrounds, and experiences to our viewers. That said, there's a certain amount of pride I have in being a part of a media space that is pioneering the authentic journey of Black stories. Not only the stories of Black Americans, but the stories of all those who are native to the diaspora in various aspects. What is seen as trending in current climate of our news cycle is the constant narrative of our network. As we planned our Black History Month celebrations across our programming and promotions, we decided this year to take a deeper look at the role music plays as a soundtrack to what's going on in our world and what that looks and feels like during particular eras. This weekend, we will debut Unsung Presents Decades. The four-part special program features artists and society-defining moments of the 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s. Tonight, we're giving you a first look at our 90s episode, which airs in April. After, please stay tuned for an engaging panel conversation, which includes my colleague, Jason Ryan, Director of Programming and Production for TV One and Clio TV, and the executive producer in charge of Unsung. Viewers can watch the first two installments of this series on Xfinity beginning February 27th when Unsung Sundays returns. What I appreciate about this episode is the story it tells connecting the music to pivotal social and cultural events affecting Black America during that time. You'll also likely recognize some of the most popular songs and groups that were big in the 90s. So don't be shy about singing and dancing along when you do. But no more spoilers from me. Without further ado, on behalf of the Urban One family, I am proud to bring to you Unsung Presents Decades the 90s. Enjoy. 
February 27th. I thought it was historical. Join us for our Black History Month tribute to the soundtrack of Black America. It's the spirit of us all. With Unsung Presents The Decades. Rewind to the greatest hits of the 70s at 9, followed by the 80s at 10, with exclusive brand new stories. It's the energy, it's the vibe together. It's magic. Unsung presents The Decades, Sunday, February 27th, starting at 9 on TV One. everybody, I'm Leslie Mays from NBC Connecticut and Telemundo Connecticut. I am so excited to be here to moderate a panel of community leaders who share the goal of representing, advocating, and creating opportunities that promote diversity, equity, and inclusion during this Black History Month and all year long. Before we get started, we present to you Connecticut in Color. NBC Universal and Comcast celebrate diversity in our community by sharing local, inspiring, and insightful stories from across our state. NBC Connecticut presents Connecticut in Color every Wednesday at 5.30. I was raised with the notion of, you think you want to do it? Do it. Inspiring new stories about culture, diversity, and race every Wednesday at 5.30 on NBC Connecticut. Make sure you tune in to Connecticut in Color every Wednesday at NBC Connecticut during the news at 5.30 where you can watch our special stories and see some interesting subjects that we are so excited to tackle and bring to you every week. Now let's move to our panel. They're going to share their perspectives on the social movements that have changed our nation. This group of leaders, they strive to empower and inspire members of their community. Here with us today is Jason Ryan, executive producer of original programming and production at at TV One and Clio TV. Also with us today is Andrew Cade, Senior Vice President of the Urban League of Greater Springfield, representing for the capital city in Connecticut in Hartford. We have Kimberly Kersey, who's Executive Director for the Amistad Center for Art and Culture. And coming to us from New Britain, we have the Comcast Rise recipient and owner of Unknown Clothing, Micaiah Clark. So Jason, we want to start with you. You know, you produce specials about music and about culture. Um, oftentimes we talk about the risk uh, that was associated with a lot of folks in the musical movement, especially in hip hop, R&B, you know, deciding that they were going to be folks who, who spoke out, who used their music as a form of protest. We're talking about people like, you know, a number of different groups. So when you think about Public Enemy, NWA, you know, what they faced decades ago, how do you think the industry has changed to allow musicians and, and public figures to use their work for protest? Yeah, well, the first biggest answer is with the, the social media. So, you know, in, in the times of Public Enemy and NWA, there was no social media. So when they used their platform, when they had it and they wanted to speak out on issues and they wanted to speak out on injustice, it's at a, it's at a stage at a concert, it's in, a, it's in a, a performance on a TV show or something like that. But now you have 24 hour access to speak your mind and to speak on issues that are important to you. So I think that's a good thing and a bad thing in the sense that, you know, because of that 24 hour access, some people say things that they shouldn't say that get them into trouble. But the blessing of that is the fact that you have so much of a bigger platform to speak out on those issues. And I think the, the, because of the, that change, you've got more people speaking on the same thing. So when the artists speak out themselves, they're echoing sentiments that are reflected with a lot of people in social media. And it makes the message louder because a celebrity or a famous artist joins into that. Um, and, and it, like I said, the, the good thing about that is because you have that platform um, if you use it um, mindfully. Um, but, but as it relates to the backlash, you know, the, I don't feel like the threat of backlash is, is any different. I think the, the way the backlash is received is different. Like you can get instant backlash if you say something on social media that people don't agree with. 
Whereas in their time, it would take a much more of a, a, a bigger event and take a news story It'd take people protesting. It would take, you know, like with NWA specifically, they'd had police shut down their shows because they say things they weren't supposed to say. Um, so it, it, the, the, and now the backlash is instant. You know, and, and there's there's you see a lot of times where people will say things and then they have to apologize. Um, and that's when, you know, social media is used incorrectly. Um, but when it's uh, joining in a movement and being the voice of a movement um, specifically related to, you know, uh, fighting injustice and stuff like that, it, it just creates so much of a, of a bigger opportunity for those voices to be heard. Um, and I think that it's, it, it's really a, a good tool for that. And I see a lot of artists that really get very, very vocal about certain issues on those platforms. And, and I think it's the necessary, uncomfortable conversations that need to be had, but it, it, I feel like people are less afraid of the backlash these days because they have such a accessible platform to speak out. You, um, in the 80s and 90s, we talk about Public Enemy and NWA. Who do you think now in the 2020s is is using that platform well? Oh, man. I mean, it'd probably be easier to name who doesn't. Um, <laughs> it'd probably be easier because I see it all the time, even from some of the older artists to some of the current artists. It's hard for me to name them because I don't want to exclude anybody or I don't want to uh, you know, but there, there's so many, like a lot of the artists that I follow, even people that wouldn't typically make music about social justice will speak on social justice issues. And it's, it's, like I said, I think it's really easier to name people who aren't doing it, uh, because it's just so common. And, and so many people, uh, use these platforms to speak out. Well, that, that's probably a better thing than more as opposed to less. Um, you produce these specials about music and culture. We're talking about the decades. Um, with the success of this series, is there some other, are there some other projects that you'll be able to share with us and give us just a little bit of a sneak peek, a preview? Well, we, we are, this, this 90s um, decade special is, is part of our um, next offering of the series Unsung. Um, and it is a special, but we are excited about just the launch of this new season. Unsung is the longest running show on TV One. Um, we, we, we keep finding ways to re, reinvent the show with, with this 90s decade special. There's uh, other specials lined up. Uh, we did the music and the movement special last year. Um, but Unsung is, is one of our longest running shows, like I said, and, and it's always great to, to be back. We have great production partners. Um, we have great artists that participate. Um, and we're really, really excited about um, the launch of this new season. Well, I'm excited about the season. Um, and, uh, you know, you talked about all the great projects that you guys have done. So thank you so much. Um, and keep thank up you. the great work. Um, I'm going to turn now to Micaiah Clark, uh, Comcast Rise recipient. Tell us more about your business, Unknown Clothing, in hard hitting New Britain, Connecticut. No problem. Um, where do I start? Um, Unknown Clothing is a retail store located in the heart of New Britain. Um, but to me, Unknown is my home away from home. You know, it's the epicenter of urban creativity um, in our direct community. Um, Unknown Clothing gives you a quick glimpse into um, how I say it, uh, how you expect the unexpected. And by that, I mean, we're always coming with something new or something crazy or something very unique that um, shocks you. And whether that's, you know, our vintage retro games that you come in and, and takes you back to your childhood or it's one of the local paintings that we have on the wall that amazes you. Um, you know, Unknown Clothing is a retail store, but we're, we're bigger than that. We're bigger than a storefront. We're bigger than our social media. Um, it's a home. It's a creative space in which you get to express your best self. Um, but not just in a fashion sense, but also as a curator, because we allow, you know, <clears throat> local clothing brands to come down here and have pop-ups and be able to push their brand and push their vision. Um, you know, our aim here at Unknown is to give back to our community um, that supports us while still being able to satisfy our crowd. Um, so yes, we're clothing, 
we're music, we're art, we're vintage, we're retro, um, but we're also community based. So, you know, to me, unknown is is culture. It is the culture. That's pretty cool to think about, um, especially in a place like New Britain. How important has being a Comcast Rise recipient been for you and what's it going to mean moving forward? Um, well, honestly, the, um, the Comcast Rise program was 100% a blessing in, dis um, in disguise. It definitely paved the way for me and my business. Um, you know, we were able to take advantage of numerous opportunities um, in a time where a lot of people just turned their eye or, or, or you know, didn't respond, you know. Um, during the pandemic, it was it was very hard to be selling clothes. <laughs> you know, we sell clothes for people who are either going out, going to the restaurant, you know, doing things outside. And when you have something like a pandemic that is keeping everybody inside, you know, what makes them want to spend dollars on clothing? You know, so um, being um, a part of the, the Comcast Rise program, it gave us opportunities to be in front of different press releases, being um, you know, mentored and coached through many of their seminars. Um, and also, you know, being able to take some of those dollars that we might've been spending on cable or on internet or on phone and being able to allocate those things into inventory and merch, um, you know, they really helped us a lot. All right. Well, we are glad to hear that that is working out well for you and looking forward to seeing what you and your business do in the years moving forward. You talked about the opportunities that it's created for you. I want to turn now to Kimberly and to Andrew to talk about the ways that you guys are trying to support the community doing really important work, both in Springfield and also in Hartford and, and the greater Hartford region. Um, so Kimberly, let's talk about you. You know, talk some about the work that you guys are doing at the Amistad Center and also how the community can support Sure. So, so much of what the Amistad Center was doing, you know, during the pandemic and continues to do is virtual online perform, um, programming uh, based on the African American experience. So, book talks, artist talks, um, live music, educational programs. Um, we've done all of that during the pandemic, and we've learned that we'll continue to do that going forward. There's definitely an audience, an ongoing audience for virtual content. Uh, but in 2022, um, we kicked off our Amistad on the Go project, and we plan to make a more concerted effort to get out physically into the community. Um, we truly believe it's important to continue to be a source of pride and celebration for the community. And our first in-person community event uh, since the start of the pandemic is scheduled to take place on February 26th. So we'll have a family afternoon of uh, storytelling with um, local storyteller Andre Kitt. Uh, African drumming with Alvin Carter, who is a, uh, a lot of folks in the community know him, and we at the Amistad Center have long worked with Alvin. Uh, there'll be craft making and a few other surprises. So we'll be um, in Asylum Hill neighborhood of Hartford at the 224 Eco Space. And I would invite anyone who might want to join us uh, with their family. Um, to check out our website. We, we, it is going to be a registration only event. We're still going to try and keep things as safe as we can and, and attendance will be limited. But information is on the website as far as how to register and what to expect. And there's other events that we have planned throughout the month for Black History and then also going into the early, early spring. All right, we're looking forward to that and glad to see that the Amistad is going to be doing things in person again. Andrew, can you tell us about some of the things that, that you guys have going on? Absolutely. Well, the mission of the uh, Springfield Urban League is to serve the African-American community in greater Springfield by advocating and providing model services that enhance uh, the academic and social development of young people and families, promoting economic self-sufficiency, and fostering inclusion and social justice. So to that end, we have a number of programs that we have initiated to support our Springfield community. Uh, we have the Foster Grandparent Program. It's a program that serves uh, seniors who are 55 years of age or older. We also have uh, the youth component. We have uh, Camp Atwater, which is a residential camp that's loaded in uh, North Brookfield, Massachusetts. Uh, it's a residential camp that have kids and youth. Uh, we serve them on a annual basis every, every summer. Uh, we also have the Urban Lakes African American Scholarships Program, where we provide $50,000 worth of scholarships to students within the Springfield community. 
Uh, we have the GED preparation where we prepare kids to take their GED. Uh, we have the Computer Learning Center, which is the brand new technology center, and it's funded through Comcast, I may add. Uh, the STEM program is also another Comcast uh, program that they fund yearly. We have the, our brown bag program. Uh, as you know, during the pandemic, there are a number of people who could not afford to uh, purchase food. So we uh, extend uh, our services to the community. We fund at least 331 families food for the week. We have our Christmas toy giveaway, which recently we gave out over 1,000 toys to our community residents. Um, one great thing that we have is we have the Community uh, Focus Program, which is a weekly radio program that we share uh, to our community, and it helps with our local and public policy advocacy. Uh, the Wellness and Health Program, we focus a lot on that to make sure that our community have access to prevention and advocacy. So we are doing a lot here in Springfield. That, that is a, quite the robust list, um, and, and glad that you guys, especially in the times that we've been in, have been able to, to, to keep those things going, and especially uh -huh. the famed Camp Atwater, um, a wonderful institution, really. Um, I want to talk to you guys, because you each represent in a different way. We always talk about the importance of you know people knowing that they can be only the things that they see, um, and diversity, equity, inclusion, those have all been words that have been kind of buzz phrases over the last uh, couple years. You guys each working to represent in different ways. What do you think needs to happen to make sure that, that this isn't just a buzzword, representation, diversity, equity, inclusion? How do we as a community in our workplaces and the culture and the community take steps forward to make sure that, that the world that we see is more diverse and representative of reality? Um, I think, Jason, we'll start with you. Okay. Um, so... For me, specifically as it relates to the workplace, I think the, you know, a very strong way to to keep supporting uh, the diversity and inclusion and equality is to really start young. So it's one thing where a company hires um, diverse um, employees, but it's another thing when organizations and companies train the next generation before they even get to that point. Um, so that means, you know, creating programs that, you know, specifically in my business, creating programs where you teach high school kids the ins and outs of television production and you give them exposure to all of the different areas that they can do um, and, and build a career in that area. And then you, you follow through it, you know, because education is not just going to school and then going to college, especially as it relates to the workplace. There's a lot of other specific training. There's a lot of other um, opportunities, internships. Um, in my business, you have um, production assistants, PAs um, that work for free or very little money, but it's about the experience and the exposure. So I think that from my perspective, the, the availability of, of those types of programs, be it internships or training opportunities, um, as kids are younger so that they grow up and become those qualified employees um, when those opportunities come. Uh, Micaiah, what do you think? For me to piggyback off of Jason, I would say, um, you know, in the workplace, um, really just to continue to give unknown amounts of opportunities to people who were never given a chance. I, I think that's super key on that part. Uh, Kimberly, Andrew, I do either of you want to weigh in, especially about creating that pipeline and, and making sure the training is there for folks to, to move forward in advance. I think the training is uh, key, uh, basically, and I think that uh, one needs to really identify that there is a diversity and inclusion problem that exists uh, at the uh, company or corporation. And I think they need to uh, basically sit down and discuss some of the implicit and complicit biases that exist uh, within the organization and uh, make people accountable. Uh, maybe meet with uh, senior staff to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Okay, finally, Kimberly, your answer. Sure. I mean, there's been so much um, good talk and good work around diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. 
And many companies have put out you know, some really, um, really impressive corporate accountability statements and plans, particularly since the murder of George Floyd. And I celebrate all of that. Um, but I remind our allies that the learning is ongoing. Um, to not assume that they've done the work, that they've read the book, that they've listened to the lecture, but let's kind of keep it all in practice, really listen to colleagues and ask them what they need to succeed in the workplace and not assume and give them what you think they need to succeed. Uh, and you might be surprised. When you think about the, the, where we're trying to, to represent and to, to be accounted for um, in spaces where often we are the only ones or there aren't as many of us, what do you think that means for, for our allies? How can they step up to help, you know, during Black History Month, but year round? Kimberly? To just really be a good listener. Um, you know, again, as I was saying, just not assuming that you know the answer. I, I think that it's great that a lot of folks have started down this DEI journey and have leaned in and, and tried to be um, allies and partners in the struggle, um, but really listen and understand that it's an ongoing uh, educational process for, for everyone that's involved. Jason, did you want to chime in on that one? Oh, well, I, I'll, I'll chime in and I hope I'm on track with the, with, with the right question, but as it relates to allies and, and Black history, I, I think it's also important to expand the what you the approach to black history and and celebrate people who are currently doing things as well you know like when i was in school black history month was always older stuff like it was you know martin luther king and civil rights movement and stuff like that that happened before i was born but and it's important to learn that stuff and it's important to recognize it but it's also important with that to also celebrate what's currently happening. There's there's a lot of uh, future history makers, if, if that makes sense. There's a lot of people doing great things in the community um, now or in the last couple years. And I think that people like that deserve the, the spotlight and they deserve to be recognized and honored during Black History Month as well because it's not happening right now, it's still history. Um, it's not happening right at this moment, it's still history. We don't have to only go all the way back, but we need to uplift those and celebrate those who are doing things now. I absolutely agree with that 100%. And you talked about uplifting. Um, as we get ready to wrap up, I wanna do a quick round uh, table, round circle, round robin uh, with you guys, everybody. Name a song that over the years you've looked to, since we started out talking about music, name a song that you've looked to, to give you inspiration, to get you through tough times, to give you that feeling that you could persevere. Jason, we'll start with you. Wow, you put me on the spot. I'm a, <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge music fan, so I'm, I'm racking my brain right now. But um, one song I will say that it's always inspiring is the song um, Optimistic by Sounds of Blackness. Um, I'm a big 90s fan. I, I love that that New Jack type of sound. Um, but the lyrics of that song are very uplifting and, and very positive. And, and it's it's a good motivational song. Um, great motivational song. Optimistic. All right, Andrew, what about you? I, uh, you're in New Jack City. I am old school. <laughs> I got to go with uh, Marvin Gaye and What's Going On. Because he talks so much about what exists now, and that song was uh, produced back in 1985, but it's still relevant today. Talking about mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and uh, war and uh, violence and all of that. So it's very relevant to me and it motivates me uh, today. You can never go wrong with Marvin. Um, Kimberly, what are you next? <laughs> I, for, I think Lean On Me is just is so iconic. Every time I hear that, when I think about different points in my life when that song has come on, it just always seems to relate and it always just, you know, reminds you of, of the support network that you have around you and how you can be a support to others. Absolutely. Love that, Bill Withers. And finally, Makaya, what about you? Um, for me, it's going to be a, a local artist. Um, his name is Vernon Thompson. He's actually a, a principal, um, I believe, in Bridgeport or New Haven um, of school. And he has a song called The Spirit of Joe Clark. And the song really just talks about 
you know, tr being strong and, and, and taking action and taking lead. And I think, you know, in the times that's going on now, that's some strong points that we need. And it all comes together. Speaking of, of Lean On Me, you know, and Joe Clark, there you go. There's a tie-in right there. Mm -hmm. um, well, if I had to pick one, um, I would say... Uh, Black Parade by Beyonce. It's a newer song, but one that really, I think, you know, does a lot to make us feel proud and empowered. Um, thank you guys so much uh, for being part of this panel. We've come to the end of our discussion, and we're so glad that you all were able to join us. I hope that you enjoyed this and hearing from each one of these amazing members of our panel. We want to say a special thank you to Comcast of Western New England region, TV One, and NBC and Telemundo Connecticut, as well as everyone that collaborated to make this event possible. This event is part of a series, a four-part series called Unsung Presents the Decades that will air on TV One starting on Sunday, February 27th. It also includes films featuring the 70s, the 80s, and the 2000s. So make sure you tune in to enjoy the rest of the featured films that celebrate black heritage and the movement decade by decade. I'm Leslie Mays. It was so great to talk to you all and be well.